the researcher and the media, both uh, internal and external. Uh, we are converging here today uh, to get a briefing as a select committee uh, of transport, uh, public works, and infrastructure and public service and administration to be briefed by the uh, Department of Public Works and Infrastructure uh, on its uh, annual report. Uh, that is the focus of our meeting today. So we, <clears throat> we, we, we are mindful of the, of, uh, the challenges that uh, we have uh, gone through uh, in the last uh, six months. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, work must continue. Uh, uh, what is quite critical also is that uh, uh, we also uh, make a reflection in terms of uh, our last engagement with the department uh, on its presentation on the annual report. Uh, it, was the, it was the 30th of October 2019. And uh, there are a number of areas that uh, that honourable members raised, but uh, uh, between that time and today, uh, there has been a series of engagement between ourselves and the department through uh, the strategic plan presentation and the annual performance plan, but also with the uh, briefing, uh, whether it could be through the. Uh, uh, engagement with uh, the department's entities or through the uh, COVID interventions. Uh, what is quite critical is that work has been unfolding and therefore, uh, without any waste of time, let me just check with the, the committee secretary as well, are there any apologies that we have received that needs to be registered? Thank you, Chairperson. Yes, we do have apologies. Uh, the first one is Honorable Khai, as we all know. The second one is Honorable Matewula. And the third one is Honorable uh, Bratathas. He says he's going to join us late. Thank Those you. are the apologies. And also, then, the one of the minister, I think that one at least you will handle it, Chair. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, we have uh, received correspondence from the office of the minister. So let's uh, let's let's let's, let's note and, uh, and register those apologies. And uh, without any waste of time, uh, give over to the deputy minister to uh, lead the charge. Uh, over to you, deputy minister. Uh, thank you, thank you, honourable chairperson, and uh, a good uh, day to honourable members. Uh, the committee support team, as well as the officials from our department, media present, uh, allow me to just uh, indicate, Chairperson, that um, uh, dealing with the annual report sometimes feels like you're dealing with uh, past tense issues that have uh, long been overtaken by events because we are now already six months uh, after, at, at six months after the end of the financial year. But Chair, allow me to indicate that the year 2019-20 financial year is, is, is the year which was the last year of the fifth term in terms of strategy and plans uh, and, and um, as, as the sixth term of parliament, we found, we, we found uh, already the work being done uh, and we proceeded to try and enhance uh, that work. And therefore, as it is a transitional year, um, some of the issues uh, would have been, um, what, I don't want to say obsolete, but would have been overtaken by events. Um, let me indicate that uh, this year, 
2021, we've seen the rollout of the district development model, which was uh, pronounced upon in the in the in the last uh, leg of the last financial year, and that development model is helping us uh, to enhance our oversight work over the provinces as well as over the municipalities. And therefore, maybe as, as part of your um, work as, as, as oversight bodies, at, at some point you would need to have that report of the district development model as it will help uh, reflect on what is happening uh, in our provinces as well as in our municipalities. But uh, be that as it may, uh, um, we, we must indicate that uh, also this last term has helped us. Um, we, we came in with some vigor that the work that had already started uh, around the expropriation uh, of land bill, uh, we were able to push that work through to a point now that that bill is uh, with parliament um, for public participation purposes uh, and, and uh, for uh, the legislative processes. So Chair, I must uh, indicate that uh, some of the work that we found unfolding uh, as we joined the as the sixth term, we we have tried to push through as much as we can, um, and and therefore the report will indicate that. Uh, but also with the economic situation of the country, um, the the down rating, downgrading or down ratings that have affected us, especially in the midst of the, the financial year have uh, had some bearing on, on the performance generally uh, of, of the department uh, owing to the financial status and um, the, the COVID became the, the last nail, even though one would say COVID has struck us right at the end of, of the financial year. But uh, the, those last uh, touches on the work uh, have, have affected us uh, quite badly. Um, but uh, Chair, we do have the presentation which was uh, circulated, I believe, on time. Um, but we do have, um, e even though the minister is not with us, but we do have and the, the acting DG is not with us owing to some work that uh, he has to present on behalf. Oh, he's back. I, I see now he's locked in. Um, he had attended the cabinet uh, meeting, so he's, he's back. I can see him now. Um, he will lead the presentation, of, therefore, of the annual report together with his team of uh, a number of in fact, almost all the DDGs are here that will support him in that work. But mine is to say that uh, uh, post the, the end of the financial year with COVID, uh, some of the, even the response plans have had to, to change. Um, but uh, yes, the, the, the acting DDG uh, in Tears Faisal will lead the presentation and we are here to take questions uh, if any at the end of the presentation and the team that supports uh, the, the acting DG is with him. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I hand over uh, with your permission to uh, Mr. Faisal to, to lead us in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Tia. Thank you very much, uh, dear Minister, and uh, good afternoon to the chairperson and the honorable members of the committee. 
uh, Chairperson, we'll be briefing the Select Committee on our annual performance, both uh, the non-financial performance and the financial performance for 2019-20, which is the last year of the last five-year cycle of the fifth administration. And we are approaching the presentation in two parts. The first part talks about the mandate and performance of the department and includes the performance indicators for both the, the uh, main vote, the department itself, as well as the entity, the property management trading entity. And then we move beyond that to present the financial statements in part B of the financial performance and financial position of the main vote, followed by the financial performance and financial position of the property management trading entity. Chairperson, I just want to move on to slide number four uh, and explain a few things with respect to our constitutional mandate is provided for in Schedule 4 of the Constitution. A public works is essentially a concurrent mandate, and this requires us to collaborate with the nine provincial departments of public works and provide leadership to the sector as a whole. With respect to legislation, we are driven mainly in our property business by the, the Government Immovable Asset Management Act of 2007, which regulates the provision of immovable assets to the national departments within the Republic. We are also driven by the construction industry as well as the, uh, the legislation governing the Council for the Built Environment, as well as six professional council acts which regulate the built environment and the built environment professions as a whole, and also by a number of policy mandates, including our white papers, which are somewhat dated, as well as the property sector transformation charter and the green building framework of 2011. I'll move beyond that, uh, Chairperson, to slide number five. And important to explain how the department functions internally, that with respect to the main vote and our property arm, uh, we don't have a duplication of functions. Uh, this is essentially a streamlined structure that ensures we don't duplicate services between the two. And in the main vote, we have mainly the expanded public works program on slide five, as well as our policy function, which is formally called the property and construction industry policy program, which drives the transformation as well as a policy making within the property and construction sectors. And we also have prestige management. Prestige management is the customer relationship interface between ourselves as a department and our client base, including the executive, the legislature, as well as the judiciary. Uh, the service delivery itself takes place in the property management trading entity on the right, while prestige management deals with the customer interface and the customer relationship management, if one can term it that. On the right side, the property management trading entity is made up of essentially five broad streams, which is real estate and investment services. This is an investment planning function um, and our, our strategy for property management and property and infrastructure delivery is dealt with through that particular branch called real estate and investment services. And then we deliver the infrastructure through a number of modes, one of which is construction. We either give you a new building, uh, we refurbish a, an existing building, or you move on to the next program called real estate management, or we lease a building in from the private sector. That program called real estate management is also responsible for leasing out state buildings to the private sector and others. And we also have a real estate information and registry service, which is a critical function that develops and, and, and implements the, the, the uh, asset register of the state, uh, currently uh, with the National Department of Public Works and in the throes of being rolled out nationally to develop a state asset register. And finally, we have facilities management where the maintenance and upkeep of all state-owned buildings uh, is effected. And in the center, Chairperson, we have shared services. All of these services are rendered to both sides of the, of the coin. Our IT, legal services, human resources, governance, intergovernmental relations, finance, and also internal audit and gender support are the shared services in the department uh, that services both ends. Moving on to slide six, Chairperson, for the purpose of the presentation, the uh, performance is categorized in a number of different uh, uh, streams. 
uh, the fully achieved are marked in green as uh, fully achieved. We also have yellow, amber, and red, depending on the progress achieved on the target, the yellow being 50 to 89%, and those below 50% being marked in amber and red. Moving on to slide number seven, before I hand over to my colleagues, the chairperson, and members of the committee, I want to, um, to share with you that the presentation is stratified into seven different areas uh, and seven different thematic areas, as it calls it, um, to, 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 to present our performance for the year and to, uh, to create a platform for better understanding of our performance. We deal with issues of fraud and corruption, as well as management of capacity and compliance. In the first stream, we move on to policy, regulation, and empowerment issues. And then we move on to sector coordination and the concurrent mandate and capacity building, as I mentioned, public works is a concurrent mandate. So we work very closely with the provincial departments of public works through the provisions of the Intergovernmental Relations Act and our MINMAC forum, which is driven by the minister, the deputy minister and the executive. And then we talk about the coordination of public employment programs where the expanded public works program uh, is our flagship program with respect to public employment. Then we go on to real estate and facilities management, and then construction project management. And we conclude with a program that is recent in the department, and it focuses on our contributions to the ocean's economy through our small harbors development program. Chairperson and members of the committee, let me hand over to two of my colleagues. Mr. Luazi Matlangu is the acting uh, DDG for, for governance, and uh, the CFO, Mr. Mantla Sitole, Mr. Matlango will start by presenting on the seven thematic areas, our non-financial performance for the year under review, followed by the CFO, Mr. Sistole, who will go through the financial statements for TPW, the main vote, as well as PMT, our property arm. Mr. Matlango, I'll hand over to you from slide eight to take uh, the committee through the presentation. Chairperson and members, thank you so much. Um. Thank you, uh, Acting DG. Uh, uh, also, uh, good, uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson of the Select Committee, uh, Honorable Members of the Select Committee, uh, Deputy Minister Acting DG, and Expo colleagues. If I could just ask to share from my side so I can like, then quickly uh, be able to scroll uh, fast. Uh, please, Tulani. Thank you. Um, are you able to see on the screen? Yes, 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 Carlo. Thank you. Yes. Um, as uh, I'll, I'll start, I'll, I'll continue from where the DDG, uh, ethic DG uh, Ray, uh, issue. Uh, I'll start quickly the thematic phase. This, this basically, the, the annual report has five chapters. Chapter one, general information, where you find the minister's uh, information uh, statement and uh, the accounting officer's report, which then contains the details of this. And then chapter two is the performance information, which is as per the annual performance plan. And chapter three is the governance issues, which will contain also the uh, parliamentary committees and meetings and resolutions, as well as the internal, um, as well as the audit committee uh, report, which is a summary of the work that we've done. Um, and then chapter four is split into two sections, part A, which is human resource management information, human resource information, uh, main vote, DPWI, and then part B uh, for PMTE. And then the part, and then chapter five of the annual report also split into two, sections that relates to financials, which is um, main vote DPW and So I'll take you through uh, the non-financial, which is chapter one of the annual report up until chapter four, and then the CFO will then deal with chapter five. So uh, thematic areas, just high level, anti-fraud and corruption, we've got an 80 analysis that was done. And I think um, <clears throat> in terms of that, a total of 293 cases. Uh, of which 256 have been completed, amounting to about 83, 87% uh, completion. And then the remainder at various stages of the investigation, uh, some have been referred to the law enforcement uh, 
uh, such 19 cases referred and then uh, other cases at various stages to, to, towards completion. So that's basically for the corruption management of capacity in the department. We're dealing basically with the internal processes of uh, beefing up the capacity, which one on one hand, you are also normalizing the organizational structure through the addressing or uh, through, uh, through by, by addressing issues of um, uh, appointments, uh, appointments additional to the structure, uh, also dealing with issues of contracts management as part of dealing with that and addressing also the vacancy rate, uh, which we were sitting at 14%. Uh, and then also to deal with compliance issues, we basically looking at all the legislative or, pre or, or regulatory prescripts where we then need to comply with. And, and I think if you look at the nature of the audit, uh, audit by the Auditor General of South Africa, you'll also see certain elements where it will also represent the, le the level of compliance and where the department has not achieved or has failed to comply. And this is a system or a process that we've started long time gu uh, guided by the Department of Plan uh, Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation under the what you call MPEC management practices. Uh, management practices, um, uh, uh, and that then encompasses areas where we had to, uh, uh, to to deal with in terms of compliance, from strategic to human resource, IT, governance, accountability structures, as well as finance, and we looked at the whole uh, aspect of uh, compliance matters. The police regulation and empowerment, one is you'll see when we get into the detail of the report, uh, is also to look at policy that govern the government department from Kiyama Public Works Act actions, by uh, expropriation bill, uh, and uh, also look at other regulatory measures that are in place that we also need to adhere to, as well as to use those policies to influence, and then also policies where we then need to adhere to in terms of the PFMA and that. So we also have uh, the other policies such as empowerment policies in the property. We also have policies and frameworks that they need to deal with the capacity building, the pipeline. And I'll also touch on some of the areas when I get into the, the detail of performance indicators. And also these issues that then deal with the empowerment aspect of it and is part of contributing to government broader transformational agenda. Uh, one of them being the the, the leasing strategy, which is for which form part of empowerment in the property sector. Uh, we also have sector coordination. Sector coordination here, we're basically looking at the relationship between National Department of Public Works and Infrastructure, working together with the Provincial Departments of Public Works and Infrastructure. We call that a sector, uh, basically, we also would recall there's also what we call 10 by 10, which is basically an, or nine, pro, nine, provincial infrastructure, uh, nine provincial departments plus public works nationally, as well as national treasury on, on, on issues that relate to the uh, common, common themes, as well as common areas where we deliver services. And the sector basically was to look at improving coordination, improving planning across the sector, as well as to a large extent, also bringing on board the, the, the delivery of infrastructure for accommodation and service delivery at a lower level, such as uh, local government and working to that. Uh, and I think this is now further enhanced by the sixth administration in the, in the context of a de district development model. Uh, and that touches on concurrent. We also have a skills pipeline program that also fits into the built environment, which has three streams basically looking at uh, uh, what you call the, the, the drawing the interest from schools in rural areas, bringing them on board with an interest in the built environment. You're looking at the intermediate strategy, which then looks at those that are placed in various departments, be it national, provincial, or local municipalities, that then will form part of internships, uh, 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 and it's uh, so also what you call on the job training. And then you'll also have the last part, which is your push strategy, basically, or your push strategy, which then you now feed into the bigger uh, skills capacity that will be required for future. Um, and, and particularly in this context, now that we've got the infrastructure and infrastructure plan of 2045, you need to bring into um, the resources that will be required in future. Hence, we put it in terms of the skills capacity for the state. Uh, coordination of public employment, that's EPWP, quite a number of initiatives uh, from uh, 
work, so works of work opportunities that have been created across the country, participation of learners in various programs such as Vukupile, uh, also participation in financial literacy, which is supported by the which was also supported by the uh, the financial sector conduct authority, uh, and also to bring about the skills uh, within uh, the communities, financial, business, uh, etiquette, and also a number of other initiatives that are spread across the country. So through EPWP, then they will coordinate those programs to bring about that element of change, which then also touches to a large extent the challenges that are faced by the country of poverty, unemployment, and inequality, and then bring them and eventually uh, create that niche market of them creating uh, sustainable uh, uh, businesses, be it smaller companies or cooperatives that then will feed into the mainstream economy. Then we have uh, real estate, uh, where we then deal with uh, a number of issues. In this case, the leasing aspect of it, where we've got a portfolio of leases, and which are basically private leases and state-owned uh, leases, and also also the the approach to which we handle the issues of leases also deals with an empowerment aspect of it, where we then look at how then do we change, <coughs> excuse me, the skewed picture of landlords, uh, particularly if you look at the historical nature of landlords, and also bring about that empowerment to black landlords that will then participate in that. So it's a lot of negotiations, agreements on the on on the on the on the uh, uh, the rentals, as well as also looking at the financial aspect of it, and in terms of those with those those when when they get into the leasing aspect, you also look at how then through our period of leasing, they also have support from the financial sector that will also support them in doing that. So you've also have those kind of engagements that we had that we've had as well. Facilities management, I think this is where you look at the maintenance aspect of it, which has a large portion of uh, maintaining maintaining our assets, which has a large portion from uh, in, in terms of empowerment policy. Uh, that touches a lot, a great deal on uh, black owned companies that participate in these uh, 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 facilities management issues. Cost construction project management, a uh, number of pro uh, projects that are constructed um, at various stages with a myriad of them uh, that then uh, uh, stretches across the country uh, in terms of facilities, uh, construction facilities, uh, update, uh, re uh, renovations, uh, as well as uh, additions to um, uh, uh, to those facilities, ranging from correctional services, justice, magistrate courts, and subs. So you've got a myriad of those that are dealt with in that. And then, and then the contributions to the ocean economy. This is through the small harbors, coastal development, and nodals, where beyond just the twelve proclaimed fishing harbors in the Western Cape, you also have other uh, other provinces where we have started initiatives on how to improve that, and quite a number of them in the Eastern Cape, not, I mean, Northern Cape, uh, also focusing on uh, um, how we can bring about the change in those, uh, in, in a number of initiatives, which I will also touch on just to give you the geographical spread of some of these initiatives. So that just basically summarizes the entire um, uh, annual report in terms of the initiatives in the past, uh, financially 1920. And then the rest of the slides, Che, is then basically detail of the indicators as in chapter two of the annual report. Uh, the next slide is basically a high level summary of the indicators main vote DPW in terms of the targets that have been achieved. Uh, I'll bring you back to this one to, to ex explain the, how we do the performance grid, where zero to 10 is basically, if you see the bar in red, it means that we have not achieved the target. It's very low and poor performance. 11 to 49 is weak performance, 50 to 89 is average performance, and then 19 above is deemed as good performance, which is an achievement above that. So if you bring it back to this graph, you will see that our department is mainly in the yellow zone, which is basically average performance. But if you look at the overall, it's sitting at 62%, if you will, uh, of the level of performance. So it's basically an average performing. With uh, this, per this percentage being taken down, Last by program four, which is your policy. And then when I get to the slides, I'll explain the indicators and the challenges that then contributed to this uh, aspect. When we get into the programs themselves, now the detail of the programs that then support this level of performance, program one 
you have uh, these indicators uh, that the, the general informed indicators uh, in program one, the ones that really give gave effect or the, that gave us the challenges were basically one, you're looking at the irregular expenditure, which we're targeted to deal with the irregular expenditure of baseline of 114 to have dealt with it all totally, but we ended up dealing with uh, that at 7%, sitting at 7% annual financial year. Uh, with reasons such as high vacancy rate in the area of finance, that then has to do with the irregular expenditure, which includes the investigation, identifying this irregular calculation, and all those things. So there's still an issues around capacity within that area. And then also where we had contracts, I think towards the end, uh, most of the contracts came to an end towards the end of December last year, and also then affected the continuity of this uh, the, this program in dealing with this. And then also, there's also the process that we have to engage with National Treasury in terms of condo condoning uh, some of this. So there were some of these challenges that we had to deal with in terms of irregular expenditure. A program had put in place on how to expedite this and then deal with National Treasury dealing with the uh, uh, irregular expenditure. And I think when it comes to the finance aspect of it and also the audit uh, response will then touch on those issues. The other one is the ICT program, where we now deal with the real estate, particularly around the leasing module, uh, modules and other modules that would form part of this. Now, here we are talking of an ERP, Enterprise uh, Resource Planning, which is basically a, a system that then drives the organization in terms of uh, the, the, the resources will be required, as well as a, a platform on how ICT can support the initiatives of the department. Uh, we still had also challenges. We had done the investment uh, investment and analysis uh, was done, uh, but not yet implemented as planned. Uh, also, this, this was a case of uh, business case that is still underway and business processes because now you're looking at the change in environment externally and then you're also looking at the reconfiguration and recognizing the resources within the organization to then then align to uh, to, to to the change in environment and the extensive extensive demands for delivery so those are processes that form part of the business case and then will also improve on our business processes and doing things differently uh, EPWP was another program that's where there was a uh, challenge in terms of the work opportunities that we created, particularly when you look at the designated groups of the work opportunities that would have been reported, we then disaggregated into working into designated groups, particularly uh, women, uh, women uh, youth and persons with disabilities. So when you're looking at women, uh, there's a high achievement in women. Uh, and and and, and in, in in various initiatives and programs of EPWP, but we had the challenge in terms of attracting youth as a result of the programs themselves. I think the nature of the programs are not as attractive to the youth as they would would have loved uh, their participation to be much more. Given the fact that you've got you significantly high unemployment rate amongst the youth. But I think this is something that is being worked on through evaluation and assessments of various uh, initiatives across the country on how best to, to attract uh, the youth and improve the participation in that. And then we also have uh, 0 0.96 against 2% of persons with disabilities. Also, these are some of the challenges that we face in achieving this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this. So there's an issue of design of designing programs that will attract youth. Uh, property construction and policy, uh, where I also showed in the graph the zero, we had a public works act uh, a bill that needed to be developed. Uh, we also had expropriation act, and then uh, those were some of the challenges because these are structured in different ways when you're looking at the act, because the legal, the constitutional issues, there's tech, and then there's also policy directives and structures. So within the department, you have to look at how do you balance uh, the the area where you needed a, 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 a skills a skill set uh, or certain expertise to drive that. So internally, we still have challenges in terms of the capacity to drive the white papers. Uh, so you needed to enhance that with certain skills, uh, so particularly from a policy point of view, from a legal point of view, slash constitutional point of view, and then the technical aspect, and you also. Uh, because policy tends to have a number of stakeholder inputs uh, so that at least at every stage it's fully represented or uh, there's full representation of inputs across as they would affect 
the, 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 the implementation of that. So there were also delays in the arrangements, the chewing and throwing uh, that also resulted in these issues. But um, in terms of the expropriation bill, at the time when you submitted this in terms of annual report, which is 31st of March, uh, this is where we are. But we are pleased to present to the select committee that to date, this has been, the expropriation bill has been endorsed by cabinet and is now uh, sitting before the parliament. And then from there on, will then be guided by the parliamentary processes to continually provide technical support uh, as parliament takes on board this expropriation bill through its uh, public participation processes. Uh, the last part that also contributed to that uh, challenge is for prestige policies. We have two, two policies that we've been dealing with. Uh, one is the policy on state events. The second one is the accommodation, particularly around the parliamentary villages to house uh, <clears throat> members of parliament. So at the time, again, uh, uh, is that we have not done this. Uh, we're still in the consultation and also finalizing the inputs. But I'm uh, pleased to report to the committee that to date, as we speak, the policy on state event has been endorsed and has fully represents the views of the department. And then the one on the accommodation, there are inputs that have been made and then will soon be sitting before, will soon be presented to parliament uh, for further inputs and endorsement. And, and, and the, so significantly we have moved quite a bit uh, in terms of that, uh, if we were to compare the end of the financial year and what we've done in the six months. And then in terms of the PMTE, um, PM, uh, before PMTE, now in terms of the EPWP, if I look at the geographical spread and the sectors that we have in, the, in terms of PMTE, uh, uh, sorry, EPWP, we've got four sectors, infrastructure, environment and culture, social and non-state, and then this is the way, these are the work opportunities that are disaggregated um, in terms of these sectors and then the percentage per sector in terms of contribution to that. Overall, we achieved 101%, which is 994 against the target of uh, 981 achieved entire financial year. And then uh, I think the highest would have been in the non-states, uh, sorry, the highest is in the environmental and cultural sector, uh, followed by the non-state uh, social as well as infrastructure. Uh, and then I think in infrastructure would also recall that from 2009 was the issue of the construction and infrastructure side for uh, uh, a slump. And then it's also slowly picking up in terms of the, uh, the, the, the challenges faced by the construction sector. So I think there will be a slow uptake and also um, uh, appointments as well as participation of work opportunities. Then the bottom parts then show also now the disaggregation of these uh, work opportunities in terms of municipal, uh, national and provincial, 40% uh, in terms of national, 35% provincial and 21% municipal. And then also the disaggregation in terms of the sectors uh, with the highest sector, uh, contributing sector, non-state has already stated there. Uh, followed by um, uh, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure and uh, uh, environmental and, and social. So this is basically the EPWP aspect of it. Uh, in terms of uh, provincial spread, this is where we are. Uh, when you can look at the provincial and then the municipal as well, and then the total, we can actually see that uh, again, we've disaggregated that value in terms of the provincial spread as well. Uh, further to that, we've also um, looked at the designated groups and then the full picture of the performance of the EPWP pay those targets that we have set aside and uh, that we've set and then the performance thereof, where you'll find that the, um, the, the top part is the 60% band for women, 55% the green is the 55% band target that we had set for youth. And then the 2% here at the bottom is set for, uh, for, for people with disabilities. So these are the targets that we've set. And then of the total work opportunity, 68% were women, 42 youth, and then 1% disabilities. So this is just now the breakdown in terms of each individual sector uh, and also how we have fed uh, in terms of achieving the targets. Moving along uh, PMTE, where um, this is a high level again, in terms of that, again, you can actually see that the overall picture is still in the yellow uh, with program three, which is the construction, pro I'm sorry, program four, which is the real estate management uh, operating 
uh, below 50%, which is the ember part, which basically represents uh, weak performances, others uh, basically fair. Overall, you can see it's 58% uh, in terms of achieving the targets that have been achieved, which is basically still in the average position. And contributing indicators to poor performance or average performance, uh, again, in terms of the awarding of bids uh, within the 60, 56 days, working days, uh, is also the issues around internal and external processes that then also seems to take longer uh, to, to, to deal with the awarding of bids. Internally, you're looking at improving and uh, uh, speeding up the internal processes such as your, your committees, and also the participation fully of the line functions that are involved in the programs. But externally, you're also looking at uh, uh, the responses, the market responses to some of them. So some of them you also need to look at uh, sometimes you find that you've got a huge number that has come in uh, uh, that is bidding, but you find that the information, the data or information, contact details and all those kind of things, administrative issues are still a challenge. Uh, and, and I think that what it basically does mean for public works in terms of improving this is that there must be also advocacy work as well as working with the external in terms of understanding the, uh, the, with the broader aspect of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of tendering as well as the importance of information in terms of uh, dealing with uh, that, that process. Uh, in terms of construction, I've already alluded to most of the issues around the targets that were set. Uh, slow progress, cash flow problems by contractors. So this is basically a situation where <clears throat> you find that the main contractor will then subcontracts and the main contractor then runs into financial crisis or the challenges. It also affects the value chain, the entire value chain. And because these are linked to the department in achieving the targets, challenges with the main contractor, subcontracting, the whole value chain is, made, is also then crippled to a greater extent. And then that then affects also the, the achievement of the targets that we have already set ourselves. Uh, and then I think also termination of contracts, uh, SMME striking, I think we, we there's this uh, whole thing that has been going on about the 30% uh, people demanding 30% and all those kind of things. So all those things are also, uh, also con contributed to the challenges in reaching the, our targets, as well as managing the projects um, the, from the main contract subcontractors and stuff. And that also re delayed the, the achievement. Uh, and then there are some projects of a particular uh, nature or character uh, that then would require certain type of specialized uh, installations. And also you find that uh, from, from, from the ordering to the actual installation on site also and then can tends to be delayed. Uh, because of the nature of that project as well. Uh, but overall, externally, there were challenges within the construction sector. In terms of real estate management services, we're talking about the listing aspect here. Uh, we had set aside to say, this is a demand-driven indicator where the department responds on the basis of the leases that we then need to then renew, negotiate, and then conclude uh, based on that. So you also have an okay, uh, internal and external factors that will affect that. Internally, you'll find that there's quite a number of issues that need to be considered administratively, uh, ranging from uh, bid sitting as well, committees sitting, as well as uh, um, issues that relate also to um, to business processes and the support of the line function in this. But externally, you will find that you will also have challenges where there will be disagreements between the department and the landlords or the user clients in terms of the agreed rates that you needed. So there's that issue as well. Now, to date, what we have done in terms of a strategy to deal with some of these issues is that we've got what you call the listing strategy, working together with National Treasury to find ways on how to deal with that. And beyond that, as part of the empowerment policy, particularly again, to change the skewed picture of uh, participation of black landlords is also an initiative and a drive to work with the financial industry, the financial services sector, to also assist in that context so that there'll be that kind of uh, agreement. So these are some of the initiatives externally that will also affect and just improve uh, going forward. Uh, and then uh, Program 5 Real Estate, which is our asset register, immovable asset register, it's, 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 it's an issue around <coughs> immovable assets physically verified to, to validate existence. So basically what then happens here is that 
you will have your asset register, uh, which will contain all the detail and information about the, the, the assets. Then you need to go on, on site to, to verify the existence, the, the location, the, all the contents and the, the requirements of an asset that then appears in the asset register. And then that then you require to field work. So we had a pool of contract workers that were in the department uh, that were assisting in this thing, in, in this fashion. Now, what happened was that because there are contracts, then towards the end of December, most of those contracts had to come to an end. And then that affected the, the, the this program, particularly in the context that you will then have less on the field uh, to actually verify this. That basically means it slows the process, the, pro the progress in terms of that. And then also you do affect it, and then it will affect the, the entire uh, scope of, uh, <coughs> but we have since addressed that uh, in terms of uh, these contracts being renewed and then to continue the work. And uh, now this has picked pace, uh, picked up pace in terms of uh, this process. Uh, and I think because because you are going on site to verify, punching the figures in the system onto an app that then translates the information or transfers the information to the main server. I think there were some glitches as well in terms of connectivity in some areas where you uh, confirm the existence. And then also there's data issues uh, that needed to be cleaned as well. And those are some of the issues, but these are being taken care of in terms of ensuring that uh, this work is done properly, and then we continue with the physical verification to validate existence. Program six, which is facilities management, two indicators are very important. One is unscheduled maintenance incidents resolved within time frame. I think this is historic in terms of the system that we use called Works for You, that then seeks to measure the 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 incidents that are reported in the in the on, on the system, and then we react or basically we respond to dealing with those issues. So we still have some system issues. Uh, in terms of um, the, the data uh, governance and data security uh, of that information, which may or which then compromises the, the adequacy and reliability of information on how we then deal with that one. Now, to date, what has happened, I think you, uh, we've presented in the past, if uh, honorable members would recall, there's a system called Akibas, which basically we were then implemented in the department to try and deal with these issues that we were experiencing on works for you. So Akibas, there's a lot of training on people which has happened, and then or eight out of 10 regional offices that basically are the implementing arms of the department, a uh, significant number of those have been trained on the Akibas and then, then the work. There's also going to be that migration of data from works for you to Akibas in the cleaning of that data. So that is actually underway so that uh, this will then deal with some of those issues. The next indicator is basically dealing with renewable energy. Uh, which is part of the long-term mitigating strategies of the country, where we will see, we recall that 33.3% need to come from renewables. So we are saying from the government point of view, particularly in the case of uh, state facilities, we also need to contribute to the, uh, addressing the issues of electricity and energy in the country uh, by going the route of renewable energy. Now, this one then focuses mainly on identifying certain buildings are owned by the state, look at the structure, do an assessment, and then look at what type of renewable uh, strategies or renewable uh, 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 elements or, or, or systems can be put in those type of buildings uh, and then, then to contribute to uh, easing the load on the on the grid. So there's some, some discussions around that. One is the assessment of that. Two is then engagement with the uh, uh, power pitches and power with the independent power producers on on also looking at uh, looking at the, coming together uh, discussing on the agreements and how this we can then contribute to that so overall this basically touches on all these uh, performance indicators uh, uh, that then contributed to the picture of 58 percent in PMTE and then also just on the small harbors as we say to contribute to the uh, oceans economy is said that 12 of these are basically in the Western Cape, there they are at the bottom there. Uh, and then you say there are other initiatives that we are basically looking uh, looking to uh, in terms of strategies to improve as well as bring about economic changes and creating a niche market within the operations economy in various uh, 
uh, small harbors and also other new harbors and nodal areas. And you can see at the bottom there in Northern Cape, Port Norwood, Eastern Cape, we've got some there that a few uh, that are, are under development and then KwaZulu Natal, and you also have a few there that are there. So basically the idea there, you'll find that in small harbors, what you basically happens is removal of sand vessels, drenching of harbor, and all those. So those are also skills that are residing in various areas that we can enhance, that we can enhance, or that we can harness nature in various things that will then also improve the communities around those harbors and then creating that niche market to improve the, 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 the gross geographical uh, product uh, GDP of those environments that then contributes to the entire value chain of the ocean's economy. Uh, and so these are the areas. And then moving forward in terms of that is that there will also be revenue that will be generated from those ones, particularly when you look at facilities that are owned by the state that will then be leased uh, for, for, for to, to uh, other companies that are within the, such as your fishing, if you, if you look at the fish, how they can also look at that. So while you're looking at uh, that facility, at uh, least to a company, there's also creation of employment there and then we generate revenue for that. Those are some of the initiatives that are underway. So in terms of the audit chair uh, and honorable members, because of the nature of, uh, because of the pandemic this year, not all programs were audited by Auditor General of South Africa, so they selected a few programs. From the main vote, they selected EPWP, and then from the PMTE, they selected construction project management. And this is basically the historical uh, pattern in terms of the audit opinion where we started off from EPWP with the disclaimer, and then for the last financial, the last three financial days, we, 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 we were still sitting on the qualification, same as the construction, from a disclaimer to a qualification. So it has remained unchanged, but at least when you're looking at the real issues that are being dealt with, there's some progress in dealing with some of these issues, particularly in the context of the provision of portfolio of evidence to substantiate what has been reported that will then result in us reporting on reliable data and information that then will improve. Now, with all these challenges, Chair and Honorable Members, is that as the DM say that it's the end, it marks the end of the fifth administration and therefore the MTSF of the fifth administration, the new, the sixth administration ushered, new, ushered in a new way of doing things, particularly guided by the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation. There's a new strat revised strategy for planning or framework for planning. So we are moving to say, taking into, consider into consideration all the challenges that we faced, how do we then embed all of this into the new framework of planning and then improve? And then we have also linked it to the priorities of the Department of Government, little, then created outcomes approach of the department that are linked to that, linked to the performance agreements, as well as the minister's delivery agreements. And we have reshaped and reconstructed a new way of doing things through what you call the theory of change and the logic model in the development of this in support of that. And then with the minister and deputy minister's guidance and assistance, we've brought in quite a, they've brought in quite a lot of initiatives and guidance in support of this. And also some of the issues have to deal with issues such as conflict management or um, consequence management, uh, contract management, uh, and, and also the change of culture in doing business in government towards service delivery. And I think one of the issues that then deals with that, you'll see that in the next slides when we deal with the, with, with the chapter four of the annual report, we've also highlighted these issues that are coming in, such as the number of cases that you see, uh, the misconduct in the and also the action that has been taken. And this is what basically Deputy Minister and Minister are really gearing towards a change culture and then consequence management and ensuring that we then realize service delivery. So this is basically a summary of some of the areas that we've dealt with uh, from the main vote where we look at the, those total number of 20 and then the dismissal suspensions and final written warnings that are being dealt with as part of consequence management, as well as from PMTE 81 cases also ranging in a number of ways, dismissal all the way to guilty or not guilty. And that then is to seeks to then drive the organization in a particular way and given that we are now sitting in this context of six administration in the priorities and a really uh, limping economy, we need to bring back a uh, certain thing. And with the infrastructure coming in, then we need to really leverage on infrastructure to bring change to growth. 
Uh, that then concludes the non-financial chair and uh, honorable members, and then I'll hand it over back to the acting DG uh, for further guidance. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, thank uh, you, thank you. Apologies, Chair. But... Yes, let, let, let me just sensitize the team. Uh, uh, you still have, uh, is it, uh, how many slides I, must you still uh, take us through? The uh, chairperson, we we finished the non-financial, so now we need to move from about slide 26 to 66. All right. So about halfway, yes, yeah, that, that, that is my that, that, that is my concern. Uh, I think what we we'll have to do uh, be uh, mindful of the fact that uh, we have had uh, almost an hour now on the on the non-financials. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just be, just be, let me give you, I'll, I'll give you at least uh, 15 minutes to go through this to 20. Yes. Uh, Chairperson, thank you very much. I'll ask for a little bit more, perhaps the half past the financials. Uh, I wouldn't want them to rush it to share it to the committee, but uh, I take what you're saying. Uh, colleagues, please note uh, 15, 20 minutes. Let's push it. Uh, Chair, at this moment, let me hand over to Mr. Aaron Mazibuko. I introduced our CFO. Apparently, our CFO has taken leave. He's not in the meeting. Uh, Mr. Aaron Mazibuko is the head of finance, and he'll take us through the financial statements. He's also accompanied by Ms. Ioannita Prinslu. Ioannita Prinslu is the head of finance in the property arm. Thank you so much, colleagues. You can take it from here. Thank you, Acting DG, and good afternoon, Chairperson and members of the Select Committee. Uh, my name is Aaron Mazibuko. I'll be presenting DPW um, Financial Performance, and I'm going to ask Mr. Mashangu to assist with running the slides. Um, some of the slides, I'm not going to go through them because they are part of the slide for the financials. It is more of giving additional information. So I will not go through the slide 26, 27, uh, because it's, it's an opinion. I think it's straightforward. Then I'll start with slide number 31. <clears throat> Under slide number 31, um, it shows how much the budget department was allocated for 2019-20 financial year and how much was spent. At the end of the financial year, department spent 98.1% of the 7.9 uh, billion budget. Now, in terms of the economic justification, compensation of employees, the budget was 557 and 503 was spent uh, leaving the variance of 53 million, which is equivalent to 90%. The reason for underspending, it was because of delay in filling the vacant positions. Goods and services, the budget of 451 million and 364 million spent, the expenditure is equivalent to 80%. 87 million was underspent, and the reasons are in, in the following slide that says some of the reasons is because of the delays in the procurement, um, the audit fee we're estimating high, the expenditure was low. Then the other one is under the contractors, where the budget is for state functions. When you compare the two financial years, you'll see there is a huge, there's a slide of goods and service that shows how much was spent in 2019-20 compared to 2018-19 under the contractors. The item is utilized for, for the state functions. So we had less incidents, like for an example, the funerals compared to the previous financial years where you find um, less amount was spent, which contributed to low spending under goods and services. Interest is 107,100% spent. And we go to transfers and subsidies under the transfers and subsidies. The first line is provinces and municipalities. The budget under provinces and municipalities, we have 1.5 billion and 100% was spent. The budget under provinces and municipalities, it's for EPWP, for the social sector, integrated um, for provinces and municipalities. The second line is a transfer to uh, departmental agencies and accounts with the budget of 4.4 billion and 100% was spent. The departmental agencies and accounts, this is the money that is being transferred to departmental entities with um, approximately 4 billion being transferred to the PMTE 
the balance being transferred to um, Agrima, uh, CIDB, CBE, and uh, I think that will be all. Then the second line is for foreign government and international organization. This is a contribution that South African government is making to Commonwealth War Grave. The budget is 24 million, 100% was transferred. Corporation and private enterprise, this is the IDT budget, it was 5 million, 5 million was spent. Non-profit institution, this is a non-state sector for EPWP, the budget was 750 and 100% was spent. Household, this is uh, for the leave gratuities um, and related items, uh, 9.5, 8.9, equivalent to 94%. Machinery and equipment, the budget was 22, 17 million was spent. The underspending under machinery and equipment, it is linked to underspending to compensation of employees because the items related to machinery and equipment are your, um, your laptops and your office finishers. So if there is a delay for the recruitment, it will also contribute to underspending under machinery and equipment. Uh, we can move to the other slide. I will not be doing the financial performance because your financial performance is almost the same as what I've presented in terms of the economic classification, compensation, goods and services, interest transfers, and others. So I will also not present slide number 36. Your slide number 36, um, it just shows the analysis for compensation of employees to say how many employees do we did we have and how much was the budget and how much was spent in comparison to the two financial years. Then I will move to slide number 39. This is the comparison between the assets and the, the liabilities. Now under the current assets, the expenditure that we have um, comes from 20, um, the last time we had the unauthorized expenditure, it was in 2013-14 financial year, and it starts from 2007-8 financial year. Uh, after 2014-15 financial year, the department has never incurred uh, the unauthorized expenditure. So we have made the submission to Treasury. We are waiting for Treasury to uh, give us feedback um, after the submission was made to the parliament, whether the approval is granted with or without the budget allocation so that we can be able to clear the unauthorized expenditure. Then the other items, it will be your advance, it will also be your receivables, which will also include your, your debtors. Then the non-current, it will be your debtors, which are more than um, 12 months, and we have 76 million, and the bulk of the money that is under 76 million, it is the money that is owed by the Department of Basic Education. Every year, um, when they're supposed to be paying, there is an indication that they don't have sufficient budget and therefore they will not be able to reimburse the department. Now, under your liabilities, it will be the fund that is underspent as presented under the spending that the department only spent 98.1. The money that is not spent, it will be included as part of the um, liabilities because this money will have to be paid over to um, National Treasury. Then you'll also have the advances where the department has received money from other institutions to do the work on their behalf. And you also have the bank overdraft. The bank overdraft is as a result of the unauthorized expenditure because you spent, the department spent the money that was not in the bank account. And therefore it will result in more expenditure or it will result in bank overdraft against the department. So if we, have, we get an approval, the unauthorized expenditure, it is cleared automatically, it will result in a positive balance under the bank overdraft. Then can we move to the other slide? And then we'll move to slide number 42. These are the notes uh, where we're comparing the two financial years to see whether there is an improvement in terms of the contingent liabilities uh, comparing 2018 and 2019. And you can see the contingent liabilities has decreased from 6 million to 
uh, 4.3 million in 2019. In terms of the commitment, we have almost the same commitment. The accruals, the department had accrued more services compared to 2018, 1920. The payables not recognized. There is an improvement uh, between 20, 38 million to 307. Employees benefits is 49 compared to 2018, 19 um, uh, financial year. Then we'll move to other no, so this is the bank overdraft. As indicated, that we have the bank the bank overdraft because of the unauthorized expenditure. The first line there it shows we still have 261 million. So as indicated, that once 261 million it is cleared, then it will automatically result in a positive balance for bank overdraft. So these are the items that makes the um, the bank statement or the bank account, which is your assets and the liabilities. Then slide number 44. This is the, the analysis of the unauthorized expenditure. We have the un unauthorized expenditure relating to compensation of employees for 67 million goods and services, 13 million, uh, and the capital for 178 million. The 178 million of unauthorized expenditure relate to the construction of much schools in Northwest and in the Eastern Cape because the department is not uh, allowed to construct the schools. Any expenditure that results from the construction of the schools is regarded as expenditure not in accordance with the uh, purpose or the mandate of the department. And therefore, even if the department did not overspend, that expenditure will be classified as unauthorized expenditure. Then the balance, it will be under transfers, which is 2.3 million, and it is relating to the transfer to the agreement before it was recognized as a juristic person or as a fully fleshed entity. Then slide number 45, it is the breakdown in terms of the financial years to say um, under compensation of employees, when did the department incur unauthorized expenditure? You can say it's 2008 and 9 and 2011-12, goods and services 2007 and 2011-12, transfers and subsidies, it is only one financial year, 2011-12 financial year for payment for capital asset. Mm -hmm. This is uh, solely for the... Okay. Uh, this is solely limited right. to the eradication of the math schools between 2012-13 financial year to 2014 uh, financial year. So as and when there is a progress in the construction, then the expenditure mm -hmm. will be increasing Definitely, up until yeah. there is a completion of the project. Hey, then we can move to uh, my apologies, of... can we humbly make a request that uh, uh, we need yeah, to move to our... Uh, our gadgets when we are not on the platform. Uh, we can continue. Thank you, Professor. Can you mute yourself? Um, you can continue. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I will move to slide number 46. Slide number 46 is an irregular um, expenditure, which has increased from 2018-19 to 19-20 by 83 million. As indicated in the notes, the, the increasing irregular expenditure mainly relates to the overcharging on contract price scheduled and unapproved deviation during the procurement of the service for state functions and irregular appointment of the officials within the department. So these are the expenditure that did not occur in 2019-20. But after the investigation was completed in 2019-20, then that's when these um, irregularities were recognized in the financial statement, which increasing the irregular expenditure from 106 that was reported in 2018-19 to 190 million. <clears throat> then we'll move to slide number 47. Uh, which will be the last slide for DPW. Um, as you can see, um, Chairperson and members of the committee, the department did not incur any fruitless.
this and we think expenditure still being investigated uh, so that it can be cleared or whether the money is being recovered from the employees or the department will incur or will the department will be responsible for the 973,000. This will be the end for DPW and thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, PMTE. Can you please take the presentation? Um, good afternoon, uh, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members. Uh, GM and uh, acting DG and colleagues. Uh, my name is Lesi Chatuna. I am connected from uh, Aaron Mazibogo's uh, um, laptop. Uh, so my name is not reflected there, but I am here presenting the PMTE financial uh, performance. And can we go to, to the next slide? So basically, the, we're just noting that the, in terms of the executive summary, there were no accounting policies uh, in, the, in the current financial year. And uh, we're also drawing that, uh, I mean, uh, drawing attention to the fact that uh, the PMTE was qualified due to understatement of immovable assets and also the issues relating to leases, the overstatement on leases, and also the operating lease revenue. So we're also highlighting the, the issue of going consent that the AG also raised uh, because PMT is got a bank over draft of uh, 2.6 billion rent and uh, the current liabilities are exceeding the current liabilities by, I mean, the current assets by 9 billion rent uh, resulting in, in, a, in, in a surplus of uh, 2.5 billion rent. You can go to the next slide. So, so these are just the issues um, affecting the, the going concern, uh, the increase in bank overdraft uh, because of the current operating model of PMTE where it exp uh, you know, spent and thereafter claim money from client departments. So there has been poor recoverability of um, uh, amount from debtors mainly in the main client departments. And also the delays in completion of the project um, resulting in the, in, the, in the revenue not being recognized uh, timelessly. So that also gives rise to the issue of uh, going consent. Um, but we also say notwithstanding the indicators above the PMTE, we still regard it as a going concern given the number of um, you know, immovable properties that it has in its book. What are the initiatives that we've implemented to, to address some of the issues that we've highlighted, especially when client departments are not paying uh, the department? The first one, we are currently charging interest on all overdue accounts, including to client departments, to force them to, to honor the, the payments to, to PMTE. We have institutionalized the task team to resolve the issues that we have with client department. So on a regular basis, we do have uh, you know, joint meetings with client department to ensure that whatever issues that they may have for them not to pay PMTE are resolved. We also seek national treasury's intervention and also the intervention of the minister, wherein the minister may be is often requested to, you know, we write to, to other departments on the outstanding amount. And then what we've also done is to transfer the municipal service function to client department because they've also not been paying us on, uh, uh, on municipal services. So we set the responsibility to effect those payments from the 1st of April. Uh, on certain client departments should actually be uh, with them. In the medium term, uh, we also want to claim, uh, you know, quarterly. We've also started claiming the leases on a quarterly, uh, in advance on a quarterly basis from client department because the amount is well known how much you are actually paying on a monthly basis. So we said client department should actually pay us in advance to assist us to deal with the with the with the bank overdraft. The operation, operationalization and financial sustainability program, wherein we're saying we need to start identifying programs within the department wherein we could actually be self-sustainable self self and generate our own revenue. And we've also made a request to ring fence all client accommodation budget so that they don't use that money for any other thing except for, uh, for accommodation charges, which must then be paid to, to PMTE and also the full implementation of the user charge model where in the, the, the rate that we ought to be charging client department, uh, it's looked at, we've also already presented to, to, the, to, the, to the portfolio committee in terms of the shortfall that PMTE 
uh, has uh, when it comes to recoverability of the amount from client department. We can move on to the next slide. So this is just a summarized of the financial uh, uh, position of PMTE that the current assets, the non-current assets that we currently have, mostly immovable assets, is 128 billion rand. Hence, we said we believe that we are still a going concern. Uh, the current uh, assets that we have is 6.5 billion rand, whereas, whereas the non-current liabilities uh, is just 24 billion rand. While current liabilities currently sitting at uh, uh, 15.5 billion rand, including deferred revenues. This is a revenue we're in, we have not yet ended uh, because of the delays in completion of the project and also recognizing the bank overdraft of 2.6 billion rand. So what are the key ratios that we have? Your solvency ratio currently sitting at uh, eight to one, whereas the normal is two is to one. Uh, the liquidity ratio is currently sitting at 0 0.42 is to one, and the norm is uh, one is to one. Uh, so the above ratio exclude the deferred revenue, which is uh, 0, 0, 0 0.67 is to 1. So currently the net assets of PMTE currently sitting at uh, 115 billion rand as at end of financial year compared to 112 billion rand in the previous financial year. In the, in the, in the previous financial year. You can go to the next slide. This is just a movement the, of, the, of the net assets uh, in terms of the uh, you know, the assets of the PMTE. So in, uh, in um, uh, current financial year, the net assets, it's 2.2, uh, 2.4, uh, 2, I beg your pardon, 2.4 billion rent. Uh, it's just the net assets in terms of your assets, less the, the liabilities. So we're currently sitting at uh, 2.2 uh, uh, billion, uh, billion rent. Uh, you can go to the next slide. There's also a summary of the, the current position on the assets, the receivable from, 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 from exchange, the difference there, the change is just uh, 8%, and, uh, and receivable from non-exchange, the difference there is about 50, 57% that it has decreased. And the operating uh, list assets, uh, the variance there is about 66% change, mainly as a result of the leases, month long, long term leases that have been signed. Uh, you know, the resulting in the straight lining adjustment for, for leases and the cash and cash equivalent, that is the cash that we had in the bank, of, in the bank account. Uh, it's, uh, it's currently, the, uh, the, the movement was just 22% and uh, the net current assets, the total assets, the movement is just representing just 1%. You can go to the next slide. Um, the that just highlights the, the financial performance. The revenue recognized for deferred revenue it increased by two billion rand. As mentioned earlier, the deferred revenue is the revenue that has been deferred as a result of the delays in completion of the project. As mentioned, it is impacted by the delays in project. The impairment loss on receivable increased by by seven hundred and fifty million rand, and resulting in a surplus of uh, two point five billion rand. And in the previous years, compared to the previous year, it was 1.4 billion rand. You can go to the next slide. Uh, this is just a highlight. I've already mentioned that in terms of the, the variances, looked at the both financial performance of the PMTE, what the total revenue was and what the total expenditure was, resulting in a surplus of 2.4 uh, uh, billion rand. Uh, which PMT did, did not have a surplus in the current financial year. We can go to the next slide. And uh, this just compares the, the budget and the, and the, and the receipt, uh, what was we budgeted and what we eventually uh, received, which we mainly work on, uh, on recoverable, which is the amount that we recover from, uh, from client departments. We can go to the next slide. Uh, this is just per its uh, economic classification in terms of the current expenditure. Uh, it's currently sitting at uh, 17 billion rand. This is what we spend under current expenditure. And uh, under capital payments, it's uh, 4 billion rand. And the total um, budget that we had was 22 billion rand, whereas the total expenditure is just 20, 20 billion rand. Uh, on capital, it's 2.9 billion rand. 
while as the current payment, um, the expenditure amounts to 17.9 billion rand. And uh, the, the variance in terms of the total spend is 97%. Uh, it's just below 7% that is not um, expended. You can go to the next slide. This is just the allocation in terms of the key uh, main uh, drivers of the expenditure in the department. It ties back to the previous slide. We can go to the next slide. This the cleaning and gardening services that we that we do run on behalf of client department and the administrative goods and services the compensation of employees uh, where in it uh, you know it has an under expenditure on this mainly as a result of the delays in filling of uh, vacant positions and also the maintenance the reason for overspending on this budget was mainly due to the reclassification of expenditure between the capex and uh, and uh, and opex project uh, we can go to the next slide next slide here is just to look at the uh, more of an analysis of the outstanding amount. These are TE by client departments. How much did we invoice to, uh, to client department? We over we invoiced them a total of 17 billion rand. And uh, how much did we receive in the current financial year? It's uh, 14.5 billion rand, which represent a, a recovery of 81%. So currently there's an amount of 5.6 billion rand that is still owed to PMTE uh, by, the, by the client departments. Mainly if you look at uh, under accommodation charges for state owned, uh, the recovery currently sitting at 96%. And on private leases, these are the leases that we enter into on behalf of client department uh, with the private land laws currently sitting at uh, 86%. And uh, municipal services, these are the municipal services, the invoices that PMTE honors on behalf of client department. The recovery there is very low, mainly because of the disputes that client have currently not paying PMTE as they should, currently sitting at 69.69%, beg your pardon. And the pace and the recoverable, these are mainly the project. And uh, on pace, um, you know, the special projects currently sitting at 74%. And recoverable uh, CA, which is a project that we uh, do on behalf of the special project on behalf of client department, currently sitting at uh, 37%. So it's a clear indication that the level of recovery from client department is very slow. Hence the, the impact on the or the continued impact of this on the bank overdraft for the PMTE. You can go to the next slide. And this is the, just the age analysis of the amounts that is owed by client departments. Uh, under the current, um, the total amount that is owed, it's uh, just a billion rand. And, uh, you know, over 30 days, uh, be, current is between zero and 30 days. And uh, above 30 days is 375 uh, million rand. And uh, over, over 60 days, it's about 1.7 billion rand. And uh, at the end of the year, the total amount that is owed, it's uh, for the current year, it's uh, 3.1. And then for relating to the prior year, it's 2.4. So we still have an amount of 2.4 relating to prior year that line department still owe us. Uh, mainly, if you remember, it was about 69% under municipal services. If you look at municipal services, currently the amount that is owed from previous year, it's, uh, it's a two, it's 2 billion rand. Hence the decision from the department that um, the client department should then take responsibility to pay municipal services on their own. So uh, percentage wise, the previous year, currently we are sitting at 44% and uh, that is owed the total of the total amount that is owed to PMTE. And uh, the in the current financial year, it represents 56%. You can go to the next slide. So the key initiatives to address the the, the spiraling, uh, uh, you know, outstanding debt by client department. So what are the things that we have already done and implemented? The, the letter that we've sent to National Treasury to ring fence and reversal of devolution of capital budget has been submitted to National Treasury uh, in May 2019. And again, follow up in, 20, in February 2020 and 23rd of uh, March 2020. So we did receive a response from National Treasury in August and uh, the highlight are as follows, because currently 
the client departments are the ones that are sitting with the budget. PMTA is the one that is implementing uh, uh, you know, the, the budget. We are the one that needs to pay the service provider. So sometimes you've already, sometimes you find that client department can withdraw an amount from on an already committed project. So it becomes a litigation issue between the department and, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the contractors. So at this stage, National Treasury does not support the review of the devolution framework and the introduction of accommodation charges, especially the reversal of the decision uh, to revolve uh, capital and accommodation budget. So they're actually not supporting that, but we still believe that we would need to have a, an engagement again with National Treasury uh, so that we can then sit around the table and discuss the issue so that we can, they can then understand the merits of why we believe that the the capital budget and they should actually come back to, to, to the department because you are a landlord, you are an owner of a property, you are the one who must then determine the maintenance and how frequent the property ought to be maintained. However, the planning becomes difficult if you don't have the money with us. The ring fencing of client budget will not yield, the, that's what Treasury said, will not yield the required results and some of the budget were previously ring fenced. Therefore, DPW must conduct a formal review of bank overdraft. So, all of this result in PMTE in carrying overdraft, as mentioned earlier, PMTE spent money that it does not have to implement project on behalf of client department and thereafter recover those amounts. And also the level of recovery, it's very low from client department. We have started leaving interest on outstanding balances so that it can then force client department to you know, regard PMTE's invoices like they would with any other uh, private um, um, service providers because we believe that we are, uh, letters have been sent from our minister to a counterparty in debt. So it is mainly from the top 16 client departments within 30 days upon receipt of the letter. And this uh, has been developed and sent to the client department. So we, so we, that mainly says these are the responsibilities of public works and these are your responsibilities as client department. We expect that when we be put to, to private sector uh, contractors and, uh, and service providers. And then the billing in advance is being implemented to the client, although there is some resistance from client department. Uh, but we believe that this is the only way that you 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 know you can manage, uh, and it's also good practice. So you can manage the the bank overdraft that we currently uh, have. Uh, next slide. Uh, thank you, the portfolio committee. Or I'll hand over to to the DG to to. To, to wrap up, 18 digit to wrap up. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I think you've done it, Chairperson. Uh, that concludes our presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Acting uh, DG. Uh, we'll then uh, invite uh, the honorable members. Uh, <clears throat> I've seen the uh, honorable uh, team. Uh, let's, 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 let's start with the uh, team. Chair, thank you very much. <clears throat> Chair, um, the first, sorry, Chair, I, I'll hope you'll indulge me, but 